Stellar. So we can have um, people chat, but any questions related should be in the Q&A. Do I have that correct? Uh, yes, I'm going to uh, start the session. Uh, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone from wherever in the world you may be joining us today. My name is Leila Dadus. I am the YMERGE coordinator, and I would like to officially open the 16th session of the Distinguished Lecture in Emerging and Systematic Risks monthly lecture series, co-organized by YMERGE and CFAL York. Welcome to today's webinar. Without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor to Professor Jiang Wu, Director of YMERGE, to introduce today's moderator. Dr. Wu, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Leila. Good, uh, good morning, good uh, evening, good day to both of you coming from different uh, corners of the world. Um, I'm Jiang Hong Wu. I'm the director of the York University Organized Research Union, Y Emerge. Uh, y Emerge is a pan uh, university research center uh, with participants from science, engineering, business management. Uh, Business and uh, law and social science community. So it's 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 a it's a center that brings uh, expertise across the campus together for transdisciplinary research. So we're very pleased uh, to coordinate with CIFA and the research cluster in the uh, uh, urban in the systemic risk of urban disaster emergency research clusters to coordinate this distinguished uh, lecture series on systemic uh, risk of disaster emergencies. And uh, I'm very pleased today we have uh, an outstanding speaker from our neighboring university, a speaker from neighboring university, uh, join them with a, a equally strong panel. And uh, for this very important issues, uh, uh, that we're going to share and uh, touch on. So today's special session is going to be moderated by our own members of, uh, of the Y Merge, uh, Professor Jennifer Spinner. Jennifer Spinner is a member of the executive committee of the Y Merge. She is a assistant professor in our disaster and emergency management program. Uh, she is trained as a social cultural anthropologist with outstanding expertise on raising critical awareness regarding the social and human dimension of disaster and disaster risk management. So with that, um, Jennifer, it's, it's uh, for you now. Thank you very much, Dr. Wu. Welcome, everyone. It's an extreme pleasure to be here today with Dr. Doberstein, Dr. O'Connell, uh, unfortunately, Dr. Nepal is not able to be here with us, but of course, his work and contribution on this presentation and on this project more broadly is obviously very important and, and critical. Um, I am pleased to be able to present our uh, speakers today. Uh, please first let me present Dr. Doberstein. Dr. Brent Doberstein is an associate professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management at the University of Waterloo and is the past acting director of the Masters of Climate Change and Graduate Diploma in Climate Risk Management Programs. He's been engaged in hazard, disaster, and climate change adaptation, teaching, and research in Canada and abroad for over 20 years. Does it feel that long, Dr. Doberstein? Uh, no, it doesn't feel that long. <laughs> There's always more to yeah. explore, right? <laughs> Goes by in a flash. Yeah. Next, we have Dr. Erin O'Connell. Dr. O'Connell is a lecturer and associate chair in the undergraduate um, in the department Oh, I'm sorry, the undergraduate associate chair, I believe, in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management at the University of Waterloo. Her research focuses on hazard risk reduction and building more sustainable and resilient communities. And her particular focus is on the area of Southeast Asia. Now, lastly, but not least, of course, is Dr. Sanjay Nepal, who again is unable to be here with us in person uh, for this presentation. Um, Dr. Nepal is a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management, also at the University of Waterloo, and his research focuses on tourism, 
conservation and communities. Thank you to all of you for being here today and specifically to Dr. Doberstein and Dr. O'Connell for your um, willingness to share your time and uh, present on this exciting research that uh, was focused on the intersecting roles of tourism, social and cultural capital and disaster recovery. If I may uh, just outline a couple of housekeeping rules for all of the people in our audience today, we encourage you to um, ruminate and think about questions as the speakers are delivering this uh, important content. If you have questions, please post them throughout the presentation in the Q&A area. All of the questions and uh, questions will be answered um, at the end of the session. We dedicate approximately 15 minutes of time at the end of our session to answering all of those questions. So please insert all of those questions in the Q&A box. Um, also, we have closed captioning enabled. Um, and this session is also being recorded. It will be available at after the session closes. Uh, so you can go back and listen to the recording and have access to the transcription if you so choose. Um, without further ado, um, unless there's anything I'm missing, Layla, you can give me, uh, let me know. But it, are you think we're good yeah, to go good. to it? We are good to go. Amazing. Well, without further ado, please let me hand over the floor to Dr. Doberstein and Dr. O'Connell. Please uh, inspire us and uh, let us know all about this exciting research you were engaged in. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Spinney and, uh, and Leila and York University for this opportunity to share our research. Um, inspire us, that's a tall order. So uh, we've, we've got about 30 minutes to inspire. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just share my screen to get started here. Okay, um, so as was mentioned, um, this is basically an overview of a Shirk Insight research project that's examining the role of tourism and social cultural capital in building resilience to disasters. But uh, I will mention right off the, the start that we have focused mostly on the recovery phase. Um, we do think that there's application of this research to general resilience building, but uh, I think that's more towards the end of the project when we can reflect on our recovery case studies. Um, I'll also mention that we do have a project website, uh, which is listed right on the front page here, and um, the link is on this slide and, and on a subsequent slide as well. So uh, over the next 30 minutes, um, I'm going to personally just give you an overview of what we're calling the Task DR Research Project. Um, you know, part of research projects these days is coming up with a really snappy acronym, and uh, this is the best that we could do um, in shorthand. Uh, but that basically stands for tourism, social capital, and disaster recovery. Um, Aaron will walk us through the social, cultural capital, and disaster recovery connection. And um, then through five case studies, we will basically explore the, the nexus of tourism and disaster recovery. So you see this three-way nexus on the right-hand side. And uh, I, I've kind of likened that to juggling three balls. Uh, trying to compare two elements is quite easy, but then when you have three elements, uh, it gets a little more complex. So hopefully at the end of 30 minutes, everything will become clear. Um, so this is a, a six-year Canadian shirk funded research project. Uh, it was granted the year of the pandemic. Uh, so of course we have an automatic one-year extension and our budget is uh, roughly in the $220,000 range. Um, but we've been managing to find excellent students to work on this project. And we think we have a very robust uh, series of case studies that are addressing the overall um, uh, research gap and research questions. And, and as has already been mentioned, the conceptual foundation of this entire project is looking at the intersection of social, cultural capital, and tourism in a post-disaster recovery environment. Um, so firstly, I think it's, it's relatively well known in the academic community that social capital is critically important in a post-disaster recovery um, phase. And uh, I can just think of Daniel Aldrich's work as being very important in this, in this uh, looking at the, this nexus. 
um, basically has pushed forward the idea that the, the social networks and the social supports and connections that individuals and community have really help people to navigate life. And especially during very stressful and very testing um, components of life, uh, such as disaster. And so the research that's already been carried out on this uh, has really pointed to several elements where social capital is important in a post-disaster environment. Firstly, just creating greater resilience to the impacts of disasters. Um, people use their social networks to, to buffer the impact of disasters. They use their social networks to reach out, to uh, solicit aid or to mobilize aid, or in some cases to volunteer to provide that aid within their social networks. And so ultimately, strong social capital, the research is telling us, leads to fewer social impacts and a faster recovery after a disaster. Uh, and some of this research has also looked at the, the roles of social capital in facilitating communication or facilitating the co coordination of recovery. And so um, rather than depending on formal announcements or formal communication networks, um, disaster recovery can be uh, communicated through social networks and across social networks very quickly and very effectively. Um, so especially in a chaotic post-disaster environment, those kinds of informal communication networks are, are critically important when it seems that like everything has collapsed and, and communication networks are down, or, or at least the formal communication networks. Um, so ultimately, we find that social capital provides for faster recovery and in many cases, less inequity, um, where those who might be the most vulnerable in communities, if they have um, significant social capital, they can tap into that social capital and, and really solicit aid or um, more effectively receive aid because they're not just being ignored. They're, um, even though they may be vulnerable due to things like age or socioeconomic status, they can still work that network in order to um, receive some sort of help and to get back on their feet more quickly. Um, ultimately, we also find that social capital uh, allows for less dependency on government and for NGO help, which is still critically important in, in many disasters. But we often see that humanitarian post-disaster aid is not able to connect with everybody who is in need. And so, you know, there, there is a potential for those people to be left out of recovery efforts. And if they can tap into their own social networks, um, that really magnifies the effect of humanitarian aid and, and allows that um, informal aid to, to step in where official humanitarian aid might, might be missing. Um, we also find you know, fewer vulnerable people are impacted because they, again, can tap into their social network and receive informal assistance. Um, even in, in the case of sheltering with family, um, you know, 24 hours after a disaster destroys somebody's household, they find a way to find shelter because of their social networks. And, and there's a lot more that goes into this research. Um, so I'm just trying to summarize a few of the elements uh, and Erin will whoop, take on uh, more of this in, in her section. Um, so just to keep things more complicated, we've also added in cultural capital, um, slightly distinct, but related to social capital. And we added in, add in tourism as well. Um, both of these are very highly variable, and as we found out through our case study research, um, very useful or at least potentially useful in a post-disaster setting. So just by way of example, um, there are obviously facilities associated with every tourism offering in a city or in a location. Uh, there are hotels, there are conference centers, the restaurants, you know, all of the businesses associated with tourism. And many of those physical facilities can be repurposed in a post-disaster environment, um, creating space for emergency shelter. And th there are many cases around the world where, um, for example, hotels are pressed into service very quickly because they provide uh, almost the perfect conditions for emergency shelter, as long as um, an agreement can be reached with that hotel. Uh, similarly, emergency feeding. Uh, there's many cases where cultural facilities, um, community centers, temples, open spaces can be repurposed for emergency feeding purposes. 
Uh, this image on the right-hand side here was an image taken shortly after the 2015 um, Kathmandu Valley earthquake, where there was a, a massive, a huge number of displaced individuals whose, whose homes had collapsed, they had survived the earthquake, but they needed emergency shelter. And uh, almost spontaneously, what, uh, what was found was that these um, survivors congregated in a cultural space, which was essentially a large parade ground in Kathmandu city. And as you can see in this image here, um, hundreds or even thousands of tents sprung up in a matter of, of literally hours to days, um, because this was a space that was familiar to survivors and they knew that this was a, a good location for emergency shelter. Um, if we look at the institutions and the networks that both tourism and cultural capital uh, has developed, again, we see all sorts of um, reasons why those institutions can be mobilized for post-disaster recovery. Um, coordinating relief through existing institutions, um, promoting elements of disaster recovery through tourism marketing structures, for example, um, coordinating rescue and volunteer efforts, through existing cultural institutions, um, repairing infrastructure through those institutions and the capacity that those institutions have, and, and even providing psychosocial comfort. Um, we, in, I think in Western societies, we often think of the professional psychosocial um, professionals, the doctors, the psychologists, um, providing that kind of uh, comfort. But in many developing countries, we find that that psychosocial comfort is carried out through family or um, social networks or cultural institutions. So you, you turn to your local temple, you turn to your local spiritual or religious leader rather than you know, professionals and, and perhaps doctors. Um, economic revitalization. Tourism plays an, a very important role in a post-disaster environment because it provides the livelihoods that people need to get back on their feet economically and you know, basically survive through the recovery phase. And that could be individuals who were working in the tourism industry before the disaster or people who are moving into tourism as a coping mechanism. And then finally, I think, you know, uh, the last item on this slide, the motivation to recovery is, is very powerful through both tourism and cultural networks and institutions. You know, there has to be a powerful reason to want to recover. And if your livelihood is based on tourism and a lot of cultural pride um, is, is derived from the tourism product that you provide to the outside world, that provides really a lot of motivation. So this leads us to the research gap that led us to prepare a proposal to SHRC. Um, I think a lot of post-disaster research prior to 2020 was really focused on how disaster impacted tourism. And so when we did our literature review, we found many, many cases where researchers had examined economic impacts on tourism or the you know, infrastructure impacts on tourism, but we found almost no research that could point to the contributions that tourism could make in, in a post-disaster environment, really helping recovery. So uh, that was the basis, really the entire basis of our, our proposal. Uh, this is a gap and we need to fill that gap. And our hypothesis was just that tourism intersects with this existing social and cultural capital and can potentially add to that capital in making a powerful and positive contribution to recovery. Um, recently, I've become a fan of mind maps. Uh, it really helps me work through complex situations. So this is one of my efforts. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but um, if I can just, if we can just focus on the top middle elements, stimulating and hosting international aid. Uh, most immigration and uh, border control classification systems will classify international, the international aid community as tourists when they come into a country. Um, the classic definition of a tourist is somebody who spends more than 24 hours and less than one year in their travel to a new location. And for the most part, that really fits the international aid community. When they're recovering or, or responding to a disaster, often that is, uh, you know, they're traveling to an international destination for months, maybe six months, eight months, 
and then going on to uh, their job somewhere else in the world. So often they are classified as tourists and just supporting the, those uh, humanitarian aid tourists is contributing to the economy in a, a post-disaster environment. Um, if we look on the right-hand side, rehabilitating, rehabilitating infrastructure, um, tourism businesses are critically important in a post-disaster environment. Uh, those businesses want to recover quickly so that they can uh, begin to generate revenue again. And so if a hotel, for example, is damaged or some other kind of a tourism business uh, infrastructure, it's often the business itself that will take on the challenge of rebuilding and recon uh, reconstruction and often in a very rapid way. Um, also those tourism businesses, if they feel that they can contribute more widely to other infrastructure, like a, a damaged road, um, which is leading to that hotel, then maybe they're also contributing to wider community infrastructure recovery. Um, the only other element I'll mention from this mind map is on the left-hand side, and that's all of the economic elements of tourism's contribution to recovery. Uh, again, in a post-disaster environment, livelihoods can be very scarce. And so it's, it's often very important for individuals who have survived the disaster, uh, they need to find a way to make a livelihood. And tourism often offers that in a post-disaster environment, and even much longer term, um, through disaster tourism. And this is a feature in many locations around the world that have experienced disaster, and now tourists are are traveling intentionally to those locations to experience that disaster at some level, um, and especially the recovery. Um, so this is the project so far, five years on. Um, we have a total of five case studies that we've looked at through one undergraduate student, three master's student, and one doctoral student. Um, our case studies, we have two case studies in Nepal, and that's both, both of those are related to the 2015 earthquake. Um, one of those case studies was in Kathmandu City, the other in a very remote village called Langtang Village, which essentially was almost wiped off the map from um, a landslide triggered by the earthquake. Um, but that village ha has now recovered to a certain extent. Uh, the third case study was 2013 Typhoon Haiyan, so that's now a 10-year post-disaster recovery um, trajectory. And then two case studies in Indonesia, one Mount Merapi near Yogyakarta, which erupted in 2010, and a uh, very significant tourism connection there. Uh, the oldest case study that we've looked at was a flash flood in a village called Bukit Lawang in Sumatra, Indonesia. That happened in 2003. And earlier this year, um, the undergraduate student and I and another student traveled to that location to look at the 21 year history of recovery after that disaster. Okay, I'm gonna hand the floor over to Dr. O'Connell at this point. Perfect. Thanks so much, Brent, for that um, introduction to the project. And Brent has already spoken a little bit about social capital and cultural capital and tourism. And what I want to just do now is take a few minutes to kind of give you an overview of the framework that we're using to define these terms of social capital and cultural capital, uh, particularly, because there are some slightly different definitions. So I think this overview will, will, will provide you with a little bit of context uh, for understanding the case studies that we'll look at in just a few minutes. So in terms of social capital, we've recognized that there are lots of uh, sort of networks and connections that people have that have a significant impact on their post-disaster recovery experience. Um, but we rec also recognize that there's different types of networks that people might have. And so we're using the bonding, bridging, and linking social capital framework to define and sort of categorize those different types of networks that people have. So if we think about the bonding social capital, this is really uh, defined as more of a horizontal linkage. So you have a homogenous group of people, homogenous usually in terms of socioeconomic status, in terms of cultural or religious aspects. And so these really tend to be the people that you have a close bonding network with. So your, your family, your close friends, your immediate sort of neighbors or your immediate kind of community members. 
And then we can move on to thinking about bridging social capital. And this is where you have linkages between communities or different groups of people that are connected in, in some other uh, type of way. So there's a lot more hetero heterogeneity between the bridging social capital um, where you might be connected, let's say it might be some type of farmers organization where people are coming from different areas and different socioeconomic statuses. Or, you know, perhaps in light of the fact that the Euros are on right now, it's a, a soccer team that maybe the kids are playing on a soccer team. And, uh, you know, you have people coming from different parts of the city or different uh, communities that might have different uh, religious aspects or um, cultural aspects or socioeconomic status, but they're brought together and have that connection and network in some way. And then we also have the linking social capital. And this is really where we see those kind of much more vertical linkages, where people may have a networks and connections to people and institutions or organizations with power. So that could be decision making power, or that could be power related to uh, the distribution of resources. There's some type of power element or connection within those institutions. And so we can kind of define these different categories of, of capital that people might have access to and then see how that might impact uh, their post-disaster recovery experience. So Brent, if you don't mind just advancing the slide here. So if we really kind of think about some of those elements that Brent talked about, about how uh, social capital can really inform the post-disaster recovery experience, one of the things that we see identified in the research that's already been done is bonding social capital can be really important to particular elements. And so we see uh, bonding social capital is really just so important for things like search and rescue and evacuation or having somewhere to stay if your house is destroyed, as Brent mentioned. Um, so again, we know that in that immediate post-disaster period, it's often a family, immediate neighbors that are the people that are there to respond to the disaster. So that bonding capital really helps support that. As Brent also mentioned, um, that bonding capital is really important for information sharing because it's our, our close family, our close friends and our neighbors that we often go to to obtain information when those uh, formalized structures might be broken down in that post-disaster experience. And also the psychological uh, support and consolation that people might need. We often get that um, from our family and our friends. One of the things that's really interesting is that we, we see that um, a disaster event can actually activate dormant social capitals. So it's not that the social capital didn't exist beforehand. It's not that people didn't have the networks um, and the connections beforehand. It's just that we see the activation or the strength of that social capital in that post-disaster period as people really come together uh, and try to support each other. And so that could be through things like food sharing and labor exchange. In some cases, that might be access to funds and, and resources to rebuild. Although in some cases, uh, when people have very strong bonding social capital, but all of those uh, people that they have that social connection with are impacted by the disaster as well, it makes it a little bit harder to obtain access to some of those funds and resources. Then if we think about bridging social capital, again, there's a lot of very similar kind of ways that bridging social capital can help support the post-disaster recovery experience. And some of those are very similar to what we just explained with bonding social capital. But we also see, um, especially more recently, things like crowdfunding and the ways that that can um, provide support for people to recover in that post-disaster period. And when we're thinking about tourism, I think that point actually comes out really quite strongly. Um, if you think about people that have visited a site before and they might have feel that connection with that site, crowdfunding might be one mechanism through which they try to support people through their recovery effort. And we also see the role of volunteerism, sometimes referred to as volunteerism, where people who feel that they have that connection to the place a volunteer to go to the place to help support recovery in some way. And then finally, we see linking social capital. And there's a lot of research that really highlights the importance of linking social capital uh, for providing for uh, relief supports, but also more importantly, the financial um, and policy assistance for reconstruction. So when people have those kind of connections, they can help ensure that their community or their area or their region gets the kind of support and, and recovery resources that are needed for that particular community. 
And so when we were engaging with our research, you know, we can see that there's a lot in the literature that really highlights the role of these different types of capital. But we postulated that the tourism sector has its own sort of social capital. So if we think about tourism organizations, um, there's likely a lot of bridging social capital there that helps support recovery for tourism uh, entities. And the same with linking social capital, that there may be some clear support there to help support recovery. And if we think about cultural capital, if we go to the next slide, Brent, um, if we think about the sort of conceptual framework that we're using to define cultural capital, uh, we are really employing Bordeaux's uh, definition of different types of cultural capital. And so here again, we can see that there's three different categories. The first one is referred to as embodied cultural capital, which is really just a, a fancy way to refer to the kind of cultural practices, the intangible things, the practices, the attitudes, the perceptions that people have. And so when we're talking about disasters, that can be their perceptions and attitudes towards hazards and risks. It can be some of the just general cultural practices that they engage in in the post-disaster period. And then we move on to objectified cultural capital. This is really the tangible aspects of culture. So the artifacts that really sort of symbolize the culture of that particular community. So you can really think about things like housing styles and building styles and the religious artifacts, things like temples and mosques and churches and uh, shrines and statues and all of those kind of tangible things that really uh, highlight the culture of that particular area. And so again, when we're thinking about the post-disaster period, cultural capital, you can hopefully imagine why that's so important when we think about reconstruction being such a huge part of recovery programming um, and what the, the reconstruction actually looks like. What are houses um, being rebuilt to look like? How are those uh, cultural artifacts being uh, rebuilt or protected for future disasters? And then the third form is institutionalized cultural capital. And so this is really referring to a couple of different things. Um, the first one is really about the ways in which institutions um, symbolize competence and authority. So if we think about the institutions like the tourism organizations, official tourism organizations or disaster management agencies and the kinds of decisions that they're making uh, in the post-disaster period is what we focused on. But of course, we can also think about the entire sort of cycle of disaster management and their priorities and their strategies as well. Um, so again, there's sort of this element of, of the ways in which authority is, is designated to particular institutions and the decisions those institutions make, um, and then also the priorities and strategies um, that they engage in during the recovery period. So if we go to the next slide, I think I've, I've highlighted um, a few of these things already. Um, but if we think about the interconnections between cultural capital and disasters, there is actually a lot of literature on that. There's a lot of literature on how people's perceptions of risk, risk um, play an impact in, in their experience of a, a disaster. Um, but also, if you think about connecting tourism into that, our tourists actually may have a very different perception of risk or a different understanding of risk when they travel to different um, different. Uh, sites when they're engaging in their uh, tourist kind of activities. And so they may have a, a different perception compared to the local population. And we also see that there's certain cultural practices like things like Gotong Rayong that play a, a strong role in what's happening in the post-disaster experience. And we'll talk about a couple of those things in a few minutes when we get to our case study sites. Uh, objectified cultural capital, um, again, I think I highlighted uh, this particular point already, the rebuilding, the reconstruction is, is a key aspect there. And then institutional, uh, institutional cultural capital, again, what are those priorities for reconstruction? Where is funding actually available uh, for what kinds of activities uh, and strategic directions are, are taking place uh, for that particular funding? So these are all the kind of ways that we might think about some of those intersections between these key bodies of, of literature or key ideas that Brent referred to as sort of juggling these different aspects. So if we go to the next slide, um, I just want to very quickly um, highlight, I think Brent has sort of covered the idea that the tourism sector is really quite interest interesting because it's a sector that is both uh, often very significantly impacted by disasters, but may also play a very strong role in some cases in helping to support or promote recovery. 
And so that's one of the things that we're really interested in, in learning a lot more about um, in this research. But again, one of the things that we wanted to do through this as well was really think about the different types of tourists that might uh, exist in that post-disaster period. And so we have a few different types of tourists that we're looking at. Um, Brent mentioned uh, the aid workers as tourists, which I think is an interesting angle that we've taken uh, in this particular work. We can also think about the sort of more typical tourists, uh, which in the literature are often referred to as pleasure tourists. These are the tourists, domestic or international, that are traveling for recreational activities, um, whatever that might be, mountaineering, um, hiking, going to the beach, whatever those kind of pleasure or recreational activities are. And so as you can imagine, the number of pleasure tourists decreases quite a bit in the post-disaster period. And there's often a lot of emphasis on trying to recover those numbers in areas where the economy is dominated by tourism. But we can also think about disaster tourists, which I believe Brent mentioned as, as well. These are the tourists that are really coming to see some of the impacts of the disaster, maybe learn a little bit about some of the uh, post-disaster recovery success stories. So they might be interested in, in visiting some different sites um, in the disaster impacted community compared to the pleasure tourists. And lastly, we've also defined something as a, a, a social capital tourist. So this is where we're actually looking at the tourists who are traveling to the disaster affected location because they have some type of previously established connection to that place. So that could be some type of bonding, social capital, uh, they have family or close friends, or it could be something that's related more to their previous tourist experiences in that community. So they've been to the place, they have a connection to that place or feel a connection to that place and want to come back afterwards to support uh, that community, uh, the economic recovery in some way. So I think we can go to the next slide now, Brent, which is really starting to get into the different um, case study sites and just a general overview of, of what we found in some of those sites. That's right. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Um, so I'll just present this first case study by PhD student. Uh, his name is Deepak, and he's from Nepal. He um, examined the Langtang village, which is a very high mountain remote village that was, as I mentioned earlier, almost completely wiped off um, the, the, the face of the earth by a landslide triggered by the earthquake. And as you can see from the photos, that the village has now recovered to a certain extent through the survivors of that earthquake slash landslide. So um, the PhD student interviewed a number of households, um, surveyed households and interviewed a number of people from the community. And one of his key findings was that just the very element of engaging in a tourism business in this village increased the social capital of that individual because um, trying to engage in tourism forced those individuals to expand their network. Um, for example, perhaps reaching out to international tourism marketing agencies or to trekking companies based in Kathmandu. So it, it actually ended up strengthening their own social capital and perhaps expanding from maybe they previously had strong bonding capital, but weaker bridging or linking capital. And, and in some cases actually created new social capital through that tourism connection. Uh, that then helped survivors to access post-disaster financial assistance um, through, through mobilizing that uh, tourism-related capital network and also aided in psychological recovery because, again, there's a motivation to come back and to recreate this village, which was a very important um, trekking location and a place where international tourists would spend a night before going on in their trek. Uh, uh, Deepak also found um, the earthquake disaster created social capital, and Aaron mentioned that a little bit earlier. Um, so a completely new institution was formed to help guide the Langtang village recovery. It was called the Langtang Management and Reconstruction Committee. And in addition to kind of steer, stick handling or, or coordinating the recovery from the earthquake, um, it also became kind of a mouthpiece for advocacy. You know, advocating for, um, for example, um, Langtang Village is open for business again, or advocating for greater recovery funds. Um, and also that that's partially through the tourism network of other tourism businesses in the trekking industry. Um, so, you know, I think kind of a, a summary finding is that this, this recovery process could be a helpful model for other disaster recovery locations in the future, especially those that are highly dependent on tourism. 
I'll hand the mic over to Erin again for the next Perfect. two case studies. Excellent. Thanks, Brent. So I'll just present a little bit on Jacqueline Harper's work. Um, so Jacqueline was one of the master students that worked on the project. And again, she was focused on the uh, earthquake recovery, but in Kathmandu Valley, right in the right in the city. Um, so again, still in Nepal after the 2015 earthquake. And her research really emphasized the role of cultural capital, which um, if you've been to Nepal, you can probably understand why there's such a, a strong cultural uh, capital element there, particularly associated with the tourism industry. And so what, what she really found is that um, cultural capital was really quite beneficial for the earthquake recovery. And that, that, uh, what, that took place in, in different ways according to the objectified, embodied and institutional cultural capital. Um, so if we really think about um, the objectified cultural capital, um, as you can imagine, the uh, tourist sites, a lot of the temples and the shrines um, were completely destroyed or heavily damaged in the earthquake. And so that really uh, restricted uh, tourist activities in those areas because the tourists really didn't come back until those facilities or those artifacts were rebuilt. So there was that kind of motivation to rebuild some of those sites. Um, but there was also some issues with that because some of those sites actually were dependent on the entrance fees or the, the um, ticket sales. That was what they used to support um, the running of their organization. So when that source of income kind of dried up after the earthquake, it impacted the, uh, as, uh, the, the potential for recovery or a source of funding for recovery. Um, then if we think about embodied social or sorry, embodied cultural capital, um, again, that was seen as really important, particularly for the people of Nepal. And there's a lot of cultural beliefs about um, unity and about oneness that really facilitated uh, a sense of coming together and supporting each other with whatever they could do in the post disaster recovery period. And there were also a number of festivals um, and ceremonies and religious activities um, that actually continued on even after the earthquake, when things all around were destroyed, a lot of those places found ways to still engage um, with the festivals and the ceremonies that were originally planned. And for many people, that was seen as a really strong way to get a sense of normalcy, to help them um, feel like a, a return at least a little bit to normal in that post-disaster recovery period. And then again, there was a, a really strong institutional cultural capital that helped to support the recovery of cultural capital. So there's an organization in Nepal, in Nepal called the Guti, um, and this really helped facilitate the recovery of um, cultural, uh, cultural buildings, cultural artifacts in this area. But there's also a really strong um, a sort of uh, 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 a really strong community of museums and heritage trusts that are found within Kathmandu Valley, which also help to facilitate some of that recovery of those cultural elements. Um, but again, there were some hindrances to this as well, and it was particularly related to the reconstruction of these very complex heritage structures. Um, so in some cases, one of the things that was identified as, as a bit of an issue was that um, the national government was prioritizing the lowest bids for reconstruction of some of these heritage sites. Um, so in some cases, they were not necessarily rebuilt with the cultural knowledge and the cultural tradition of how to care for some of those sites. Um, so that was seen as a, a real concern. And along with that, if we think about some of the vo foreign volunteers or the volunteerists that came in that were helping to support clearing of debris or helping to um, support reconstruction in some way, um, there was a concern that was identified that some of those individuals were not skilled and they lacked the cultural knowledge to be able to engage appropriately with some of those really important cultural sites. Um, so there, there were some issues there in terms of um, how uh, that cultural capital and that social capital along with the tourism sector um, intertwined during the recovery period there. Um, so one of, the, one of the things sort of in summary of, of some of the results here um, that was quite interesting is that these different types of capital have some different vulnerability in the post-disaster period. So the embodied cultural capital was, was still intact and it was really useful for recovery, but the objectified cultural capital was really quite vulnerable um, and, and uh, inhibited some of the tourism recovery, at least initially. 
And then on the other hand, the institutional capital was really vital uh, to support that uh, knowledge for recovery, particularly the knowledge about uh, the heritage structures, um, the tools and techniques that might be useful uh, for rebuilding those sites. So I'll let Brent move on to the next. Oh, actually, the next one is 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 mine as well. Um, so we're here. We're shifting gears away from Nepal here, and we're moving to the Philippines. And so this is our case study looking at the 2013 typhoon, Typhoon Haiyan, that struck Tacloban City um, in 2013. And so here, this one was quite interesting because the focus really ended up being on the tourism sector, particularly because there really wasn't a tourism sector in this community prior to the typhoon event. And just to highlight that, it was actually quite interesting to learn that the government here was not even collecting data on tourists up until 2011, because it wasn't even as seen as um, an important um, industry that people weren't even really traveling to this area. And so what, what we found was that most of the people that were coming to this area were coming to visit family or friends. So they had that kind of social uh, connection to the community um, or they were just kind of using it as a jumping off point to get to somewhere else in the Eastern Visayas region of the Philippines. So it was really interesting to see what happened in that post-disaster recovery period because there were all these aid workers and volunteers that kind of flooded into this uh, really heavily damaged area after the typhoon. And it actually contributed to an organic and in some cases informal tourism uh, sector that developed in that post-disaster recovery period. So the, the aid workers actually filled a role and contributed to economic resurgence by um, staying in some of the hotels that did exist. Um, people used their houses as guest houses to support volunteers. Uh, there were restaurants that were able to continue making an income because of the aid workers who were eating there. Um, and many people actually informally just set up stalls on the streets to sell food um, to some of these aid workers and volunteers. And even just things like car rental places that were able to rent their cars um, to the um, to uh, the aid workers to, to support the recovery effort. And so again, this was really then used, this informal market was actually formalized after the disaster to help support uh, the development of a tourism sector, both for places within Tacloban, but also as a real jumping off point to visit other sites that were located nearby. So I think in the interest of time, we'll move on to the, the next case study quickly. Okay, uh, thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, I want to make sure we have at least 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, so if you miss some of the elements in the next two case studies, uh, you can go back into the recording and, and just uh, slow that down a little bit. Um, so this was the case of volcanic eruption in 2010, Mount Merapi, which is about 20 kilometers from Jogjakarta. Uh, Aaron happened to be living in Jogjakarta at that time, so I think this is near and dear to your heart. Um, this is research carried out by master's student Beth Palmer, and her key findings were really that there was an explosion of tourism following the volcanic eruption. And that's partly linked to the lack of or the degradation of agricultural livelihoods because land is now covered by ash. And also the um, central government uh, declared about 1600 hectares of land near the central vent as off limits to agriculture. So all of a sudden people were displaced from their traditional farming livelihoods and they really needed an alternative. And that alternative was tourism. Um, Beth also found that revenue from those tourism activities in the post-disaster immediate uh, year of post-disaster recovery supplemented formal disaster aid. So there was a certain amount of money revenue that flowed into the community from humanitarian aid agencies, but that wasn't enough for everybody's recovery. And so tourism um, businesses be began and became the supplementary form of, of income. And as you can see from the photos on the right hand side, there's now a, an absolutely massive tourism industry uh, involving four wheel drive Jeeps, about three to 400 of those Jeeps go onto the mountain um, every day, uh, taking international and domestic tourists. And so it, it has really been a successful post disaster recovery through these tourism livelihood activities. Um, and social capital in the many communities on the side of Mount Merapi 
um, really led to a sense of community cohesion and a, a kind of coordination of these tourism ventures. Okay, this is our final case study um, and then Q&A. And this was, as I mentioned, a, 20, a 2003 flash flood, which hit the village of Bukit Lawang, Indonesia. And that village essentially was based on tourism, especially jungle trekking tourism. Um, the village literally faces a national park that is one of only two locations in the world where you can see orangutans, about 5,000 of, of in population. Um, so it's a very popular jungle trekking location. Um, unfortunately, it was hit by a flash flood in 2003, which killed uh, almost 200 people in the village and, um, and devastated housing and tourism businesses. So we were there just a few months ago looking at the recovery process. Um, this massive mind map that student Ash Borg created, um, we have, uh, of course, not enough time to go into depth, but I'll, I'll just highlight three elements here. Uh, in terms of bonding social capital, the local tourism community was very important in helping other tourism businesses that had been devastated or destroyed in getting back up on their feet. You know, we normally think of tourism as a competitive industry, but in this, in the case of this village, um, one hotel owner who wasn't hit by the flash flood uh, routinely helped other hotel owners who were trying to rebuild. So that came out of the interviews that we conducted or that Ash conducted. Um, we also found, uh, similar to what Aaron mentioned, um, the case of international tourists to that village who developed a bond and a, a sense of uh, responsibility. They then, in a post-disaster environment, began to mobilize and raise funds internationally through their social network. And that led to the creation of a women's group for mental and physical health in the immediate post-disaster environment. And to this day, that group, that group and that uh, support structure for women is still ongoing in the village 21 years later. Uh, so that was a very interesting outcome of, of the interviews. And then finally, the linking social capital where the central government immediately after the flash flood came in, provided military support, provided funding, relocated survivors to a safer spot, and uh, also um, hired international experts to help develop a, a plan for the community going forward. Um, in the interest of time, that's really all I can mention about the case studies. Uh, our next step is to do cross-case comparisons and kind of flip the narrative around. You know, How can we take this research to then advise communities or even humanitarian aid agencies how can you build disaster resilience by strengthening social capital, cultural capital, and, and even the tourism social capital that we found? Uh, we have a workshop coming up next year. And at this point, I will post the Q&A slide and I guess stop sharing. Thank you very much, Dr. Doberstein, Dr. O'Connell. It, it really was an inspiring presentation, uh, not, not just with the amount of content you were able to get through, but all of the different places in the world that you were able to bring us to in the last 35 minutes. So thank you once again, um, on behalf of myself, um, Why Emerge, CFAL, UNITAR, and all of the people in our audience today for being here. Uh, we do have um, about five minutes left for questions. We have two questions in the Q&A. And so I might uh, take an opportunity now to post uh, to you both the first question, uh, which asks, did researchers consider how tourism companies, hotels in particular, could proactively raise awareness about disaster recovery efforts and needs? They go on to ask to provide an example, such as proactively managing messages to previous tourists by emailing them about how they could assist, uh, perhaps thinking of the response to the Asian tsunami, nostalgia, horror, guilt as examples. This could be linked to Build Back Better or we can't wait to see you again soon in quotation marks. Can either of you uh, respond to this question? I, I can, can, I can. Okay, yeah, go sorry, ahead, go Anne. ahead. Oh, yeah, go I was ahead. just I was just going to say that um <laughs> actually in in Jacqueline Harper's research, she did do some uh she did obtain some results on this. 
And I think one of the things that some of the guest houses um, and the hotels were doing in Kathmandu Valley was providing some information to the tourists about what they could do to make sure that they were safe, um, how to prepare when they were staying in their guest house in case an earthquake happened again. Um, I don't think that she found any specific results about the hotels or the guest house owners connecting them specifically um, to sites where people could donate. But that might just be because we were focused much more on the long term recovery as opposed to what was happening in the immediate aftermath of tourists um, when they were in the country when the earthquake happened. So it might have been the case that there was definitely some connection. We just actually didn't collect data on that um, in that case study. But I'll let Brent um, follow up on that, too. Yeah, we found um, a similar <clears throat> example in Ash Borg's research in uh, Bukit Lawang, Sumatra, where um, many of the guest houses are co-owned by typically uh, an Indonesian male and a foreign female. And um, this was a repeated uh, mention that we came uh, that came out of our interviews. And uh, in in some cases, we heard direct examples where that foreign, um, the, the female half of, of the ownership of that venture reached out to their international social capital network to solicit funds for recovery. And so, as I mentioned, that led to the creation of the women's mental health and physical health um, uh, community organization that also led to direct donations to help recovery. And I think even more importantly, it also led to communicating that message to the outside world once recovery had reached a certain stage that the village was open for tourism again. And, you know, come back, please come back. This is helping our community uh, to recover by you just being a tourist and going jungle trekking again. Um, I think there's more that could be done that could be formalized more where that message could be perhaps, um, you know, uh, it originates from the individual tourism businesses, but then is handed off to a much more powerful tourism marketing agency. So tapping into that linking social capital that uh, perhaps the central government has for its tourism promotion. And that will really stimulate economic recovery in these tourism dependent uh, locations. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, let's take the next question. And just depending on, uh, you know, how extensive the answer is, maybe we'll have time for the final, the third question. Uh, but the second question is, it was mentioned that there's some issues with overlap when tourism interacts with cultural capital. The example given, I believe you, it was called objectified uh, cultural capital, things like buildings. Um, in your opinion, what are some of the best solutions that governments have come up with during these sensitive situations? Uh, this, I think, comes back again to Jacqueline's research, um, where, you know, significant numbers of temples in Kathmandu City were destroyed. And then there's a need for a very sensitive reconstruction process that taps into the cultural capital that... Um, that that carpenters have, or that um, you know, designers and uh, and builders have. Um, so there's this tension between the speed of recovery for tourism purposes and the the slower, more um, accurate recovery that's needed for for cultural purposes. Uh, you can't just rebuild a temple without tapping into cultural knowledge, um, mm -hmm. and that process often takes time, especially when. Um, there have been uh, people with that knowledge that didn't survive the disaster. Um, Aaron, I don't know if you you have anything to add to that. No, I think I think you covered kind of the points that I was going to highlight as well. And we have one minute left, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um. Uh, because we are on the cusp of, of being out of time, I'm going to hold off on a asking that third question. Um, you you both see it there, though, uh, pops possibly. And so um, perhaps there's a way that we can provide an answer in another format. I don't know if Layla um, can, can help us with that. Is it possible for Dr. Doberstein and Dr. O'Connell to write a response? And then that might be included in the in the recording afterward or how to how might we do this? Sure. Uh, our audience can even send their uh, questions to me and I can forward them uh, to Dr. That's Doberson good. and uh, Okarn. So yeah, okay. we can be in contact with them after the meeting and uh, help them to find their answers. Okay. Let's to do, do that. that. And I, I have a few questions too, so I'm probably going to 
to okay. just email our presenters as well, because I'm very interested in the topic, obviously, uh, being a disaster a style anthropologist, uh, sociocultural linguistic. Um, all of what you've shared today has been uh, incredibly insightful. And I um, feel fortunate to have had the chance to sit here and, and be part of this discussion. Layla, I'm going to hand it over to you. I believe you close off our session. Um, and so please uh, take us from here. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so hello again, everyone. It's great to have you all here. Thank you all for joining us today. I sincerely thank Professor Doberstein and uh, for and Dr. O'Connell for their outstanding presentation and Professor Spini for moderating this session. Our next session is scheduled for July 18th at the same time as today. We will update you on the topic and the speaker through the Y Emergency for LinkedIn pages. Please consider following us on these platforms to stay updated if you haven't already. Your participation in this lecture series means a lot to us, and we are eagerly looking forward to seeing you at the next one. Have a wonderful day and or evening wherever you are in the world. So, and goodbye, everyone. <laughs>